My name is Kamish, and he is Ryan. We are um, software engineers from Red Hat. Um, and we are going to talk about highly available key cloak and how we go about it. How, we are, how many of you already use key cloak? Um, show of hands. Awesome. For how, uh, how many of you are attending KubeCon for the first time? Pretty much, it overlaps very well. <laughs> and thank you for sticking around till the end of KubeCon to attend this. And hopefully it will be a good takeaway uh, for you all. Um, so, All right, I think most of us saw this slide in the keynote today, and Cube, um, Keycloak uh, is a incubating pro project, and we are in that uh, chasm phase, and we always uh, intend to explore the opportunities to improve Keycloak, and making it highly available is one of the aspects of it. A um, little bit of what we want to do today is to introduce Keycloak and explain what it means um, for organizations and users alike uh, initially, and we'll go more uh, into the details of how we achieve high availability and on. All right, what is an identity and access management, and do you need one? Um, most of us, if we put some credentials inside uh, an application, yes, we would need one um, to keep our uh, content secure and provide easier access to the users and provide more seamless experience uh, using single sign-on. And how does that work? Um, a user logs in to Keycloak and he requests for a token to access a particular resource. Keycloak makes sure the user is um, allowed to do that and verifies the token and provides uh, the access. And there are multiple ways to do it using AuthZ, AuthN, and different things that you do on an identity and access management platform is to manage users uh, manage their credentials, permissions, handle user registration, uh, password um, reset and handling, and integrating the IAM platform into your existing security infrastructure. So single sign-on is cool. So on day one, you, your users now only have to remember one password and only authenticate maybe once a day, depending upon your session TTL. And you could also make it more secure using um, additional authentication, like multi-factor authentication, pass keys, et cetera. You can customize now your front end of the login uh, using custom themes. Makes sense already for like a small application, right? And this is how it will look uh, when you first open Keycloak once it's configured, the login screen for your applications and but this is all good for day one. How about day two? Now we look at integrating our existing security infrastructure with Keycloak, like LDAP and Kerberos. We would want to do identity brokering with SAML and OIDC services, and integrate with probably the existing stores like Active Directory or your own database, uh, so that you are not uh, spending more on cloud costs. Um, how you can do that, like very similar uh, user screens so that users are having seamless experience and you can use the existing providers for uh, brokering. Uh, and that looks uh, great. So what else is required? Uh, obviously, once you have everything deployed and ready, you want maintenance to be done. 
you want user workflows to be working, you want your user passwords uh, to be reset or recovered, you want new users to be self-registered without major uh, um, repetition of steps, you want the user's data to be self-managed uh, by the users themselves or the admins, and that reduces the number of tickets that you have to handle, the number of calls you have to be on as an admin, and how we can do that, like using some of these screens um, for password recovery and self-registration. And by the time you already realize, Keycloak is already an important infrastructure component, and you are heavily relying on it for your uh, security and seamless authentication and you want it to be available 24 bar 7 right and how do we do that and to go more in detail um, let's talk with Ryan thanks Kamesh so now that Keycloak is critical in your infrastructure um, if Keycloak was to go down uh, the tokens that you already have with your microservices or you're using session data if Keycloak goes down then there's nothing to say actually that's an acceptable token and so your business flow is completely disrupted and your application is going to have downtime as well. Obviously, we don't want that. So in order to understand the kind of HA journey Keycloaker has gone on, I'm first going to take a step back and explain Keycloaker is most basic and then kind of build a story from there so you can appreciate some of the challenges we have in order to provide HA architectures. So at the most basic, we have all Keycloak users or clients, in the case of microservices, going to a single Keycloak instance. Um, within that Keycloak instance, we have Infinispan, which is a in-memory cache that's there for performance reasons. And Keycloak is reaching out to a traditional database to uh, persist state. So in the event of restarts, etc., all of your critical data is still there. So this is fine for dev and proof of concept, um, but beyond that, this leaves a lot to be desired, de desired because if your single Keycloak instance goes down, then, like I said before, your workflows are not going to be able to proceed. So typically, what we see in production is people utilize multiple Keycloak instances. So now we have two Keycloak pods in this example um, talking to a persistent database. We have two instances in this example, but it could be two, three, five. You can horizontally scale as your requirements uh, demand. So by adding these extra instances, we get increased performances because you benefit from parallelism and you get the increased resilience that we were talking about today. Unfortunately, this isn't without a cost though. We now have the added complication of needing to ensure that the cache uh, that is maintained by all of the Keycloak instances. It's both updated and invalidated um, as required when the Keycloak state changes. Um, and, you know, this is CNCF. Usually we see this deployed within Kubernetes. Because it's in Kubernetes, we can tolerate pod failures. And if you configure your affinity settings appropriately, you can also tolerate node failures. However, the crucial thing that's missing here is this Kubernetes cluster is deployed to a single availability zone. So as much as the cloud providers like to say that AZ failures don't happen, we all know they do from time to time. And so we need a solution that allows us to tolerate such failures. So you're probably gonna guess where I'm going with this. The solution to tolerating an AZ failure is to simply throw another AZ into the mix. So now we have a multi-site configuration and what that looks like is we have AZ1 as before with our Kubernetes cluster Keycloak pods. Um, we also then have the second AZ with the exact same stack. However, as simple as the diagram looks, the reality is it's much more complicated than that because we now have to maintain the cache state across AZ boundaries and we have to deploy the database in such a way that it's going to be available if one of the AZs go down. Previously, we could deploy uh, your database in just the same AZ as your Kubernetes cluster. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. So yeah, the big challenge is how do we manage those uh, bits of state? And the other problem is how do we route user requests? 
when you're in a single Kubernetes cluster, you can rely on your service and your ingress, etc., to do that for you. But now we need a way to ensure that um, key cloak requests only go to healthy availability zones. So to begin with, I'll talk about how we do manage those user connections. Um, our proposal um, is to use AWS is Global Accelerator. Uh, the Global Accelerator is nice, it's a very fast solution. Uh, where appropriate, it'll use Amazon's internal network. The nice thing about this solution is it's not DNS-based. If you use a DNS-based solution here, uh, clients can actually cache the IP resolution and you can attempt, they will continually re-attempt to connect to failed AZs. Um, we don't have to worry about that with the Global Accelerator. So the idea is that now all Keycloak users connect via a Accelerator endpoint. The Accelerator then communicates with a network load balancer uh, that's located in each of our two availability zones. And the network load balancer forwards traffic to the healthy Keycloak pods within the Kubernetes cluster that's in the same availability zone. There's then periodic health checks at both the network load balancer level and the global accelerator to see um, if an availability zone is healthy. And traffic is only routed to healthy sites. So to give you an example, if the key cloak pods all go down at one time because of node failures or something like that, the network load balancer will detect this and it will report there's no healthy pods. And so the accelerator finds this out and will only route traffic to AZ2. In the event of the catastrophic AZ1 failure, you also lose the network load balancer, in which case the accelerator also detects this and only routes traffic to AZ2. So we now have our two sites and users are only connecting to the healthy sites. Um, what about cache invalidation? Well, I mentioned before about InfiniSpan. Um, I'll quickly go into what InfiniSpan is so you have a bit more context and how it helps us to solve the problem here. So InfiniSpan is a in-memory key value cache. It has very advanced clustering capabilities and it is actually an independent project. Some of you who are familiar with Keycloak may associate it with Keycloak, but it's been on the go for 12, 13 years, something like that at this point. So you can use it for um, your own application use cases as well. The nice thing about InfiniSpan is the entire stack is Apache 2 licensed. And we do provide a Redis compatible endpoint because you know, Redis no longer is open source. Um, so you can use InfiniSpan as a drop-in replacement. Um, we have a Kubernetes operator that's very mature. We have Helm charts that are, um, sorry, InfiniSpan has Helm charts that are um, available for simpler deployments. And it also integrates with Quarkus and Spring Boot frameworks for you know, app developers out there. So why am I talking about InfiniSpan in so much detail? Well, previously when we just had all of our Keycloak instances in one availability zone, um, we used what we call embedded mode in InfiniSpan, and that means the cache state lives within the same JVM process as Keycloak itself. Um, however, for this HA architecture, we're going to adopt the client server model, which is where InfiniSpan has its own server processes, and all cache state lives within the InfiniSpan process. Your application, in this case Keycloak, communicates with InfiniSpan via a remote endpoint like HTTP, the Redis endpoint, etc. So going back to the multi-site architecture, um, what we now have is uh, we're now using InfiniSpan server. And um, what we do is the InfiniSpan server uses the InfiniSpan cross-site replication capability to ensure that any cache update, a write or an invalidation, is propagated synchronously from AZ1 to AZ2. So what this means from a Keycloak perspective is when a user request comes into Keycloak, it performs a cache operation on the InfiniSpan server pod remotely. It waits for that to complete. The synchronous write will occur to AZ2. When AZ1 gets a response, it returns this back to the Keycloak pods and the Keycloak pods then return a successful response to the Keycloak users. So 
when the key clock user receives a successful response, they know that the cache state is consistent across both sides. So they don't have to worry about inconsistencies um, if a failover occurred and their request was routed to AZ2, for example. And so the reason for the InfiniSpan server is we have our SREs in mind here. The InfiniSpan server provides a lot more advanced operational capabilities than are available in the embedded mode. And by utilizing InfiniSpan server, you can automate a lot of the kind of day two operations that might be necessary. So we now have our multiple sites. We have requests being routed accordingly and we have a consistent cache state. What about the old important database? How can we make that failover between AZs? Well, we leverage some AWS services again here. Um, in this case, we use Amazon's Aurora database. Um, Aurora database is very nice because it was built with multi-AZ deployments in mind. Um, so we leverage their capabilities to the full extent here. For those not familiar with Aurora database, I'll give a very high level overview of how it works and what, why that's good for Keycloak and our requirements. So we have our Keycloak pods connecting to a Aurora endpoint via JDBC. Then Aurora has in availability zone one what they call a writer instance. This writer instance is responsible for handling all read and write requests. Um, but the nice thing is when a write occurs is the writer not only writes the, uh, to its local data copy or data store, um, it also synchronously writes the data to the data store on availability zone two. And this is all to facilitate failover. So when AZ1 does go down, um, Aurora transparently elects a new writer instance, in this case on AZ2, and um, Keycloak can resume where it was before the AZ failure. The failover from one writer instance to another takes approximately one minute. And um, from a Keycloak perspective, we think that's acceptable. There will be downtime for that minute but only if Keycloak users are trying to perform write operations. If things are cached in memory, which they most likely will be, Keycloak will actually have no downtime. The really nice thing about Aurora is the only thing we had to do from a Keycloak perspective was utilize the AWS JDBC driver. And what this does is it ensures that when AZ1 has failed, any existing connections in your connection pool are invalidated. So you're not going to get logs in Keycloak saying, hey, AZ1's not available until the connection pool figures it out. These are invalidated automatically. So no additional semantics were required on the Keycloak side, and it would be the same if you adopted Aurora for your own applications. So I've covered quite a lot of topics, I think, there. So I'll just try and bring it all back together and give an overview of what this HA architecture is now looking like. Um, all user requests go via a global accelerator. This global accelerator then talks to a network load balancer within an availability zone. The network load balancer forwards traffic to our Keycloak pods, which is in a Kubernetes cluster. Co-located within the same Kubernetes cluster are our InfiniSpan server pods. And then we have the Keycloak pods reaching out to Aurora for our persistent state. So we then add the second AZ for redundancy for the failover, and um, we can see here that the InfiniSpan server pods are maintaining the cache state bi-directionally between the two AZs, and the Aurora writer instance, say from AZ1, is writing the data to AZ2. So this architecture didn't happen overnight. Um, it took quite a while, um, a lot of testing for the Keycloak team to come to this. Um, so I'll now hand back to Kamesh and it'll talk about some of the behaviors we encountered along the way. Thanks, Ryan. Oof, how good was he? I wish I had a professor like him in my university. I would have learned a lot better. Uh, but as he said, uh, it, was, it didn't happen overnight. It was a big undertaking for us to make Keycloak highly available and reliable. And we did learn a lot along the way and some surprising system behaviors under the load while this was happening, and we were incrementally reaching our goal of making uh, Keycloak 
active active um, between multi sites. Uh, overloading situations when load shedding is required. Um, it's common for applications to shed the load uh, when the connections are overwhelmed or the queue is too much to handle. Uh, but <clears throat> what happens in, a, in such situation? Um, when more requests are incoming than what it can handle, the observation what we had was like requests are um, queuing up, memory usage increases, uh, client, client requests starts timing out. And what we did as a remedy was to drop the request by replying uh, 503 so that at least like the current connections can handle the existing uh, requests and only some partial amount of the application is uh, having an outage. And when the queue length um, basically settles down, then we resume the operations to normal. And there could be a situation where the pods are restarting and like there was a bad pod, the new pod comes up uh, because of a uh, replica set and the new pod then tries to uh, restart under high load and it tries to uh, do many parallel requests to the database to um, reload the cache. And when that happens, uh, we see like a lot of timeouts happening, exhaustion of the database connections, etc. cetera. Um, this was an uh, interesting problem where we have to solve it by introducing JVM blocking uh, for a specific resource if it is being fetched uh, from the database. That allowed us to do some uh, synchronous loading of caching and we had a better ramp up uh, after the pod restarted. And, and also using like bo blocking probes and metrics uh, will cause um, too many requests that are being uh, done leading to slow response times and also leads to again load shedding behavior. And uh, the observation was like it will stop the working of the pod and it will the, you will experience so many pod restarts for um, unexplainable reasons. And the way we went about it was to introduce uh, non-blocking probes so that they don't uh, enqueue um, too much and go into an overload situation. And some of the good habits uh, we would like to call them, uh, uh, we picked up along this and try to be consistent at is to have up-to-date documentation. It's really, really important to keep our project up-to-date and fresh and docs having the right and relevant information which is specific to that release. And we also use Antora and ASCII docs to uh, use our documentation uh, to be crisp and clean. And we use ephemeral environments in our CI system and so that like we can save on cloud costs and we are repeatedly testing our provisioning module over and over again with new builds. So we know like if something is breaking in the provisioning, we can fix that. And also uh, consistently measure uh, the uh, synthetic benchmarks that we run every, uh, every night and we collect all the metrics and we generate um, actionable data objects from those results. Like for example, how many CPU logins per, uh, uh, CPU logins per second a virtual CPU can support or how many um, login sessions uh, can fit in a 500 MB memory block or how many client credential grants can we support. So we try to keep that information up to date with uh, each run so that uh, our community users and customers can uh, read into that and look at like if something is changing over a period of time. And our nightly performance and functional test runs will uh, highlight those regressions and that data set can act as uh, the base for doing some analytics. And we, for continuous integration, we extensively use uh, GitHub workflows and actions. Three years ago, we probably had one. Uh, right now, we have more than like 25 uh, workflows doing different, different things um, from provisioning to testing to tearing it down. 
and also like reporting on the results. Um, we can do that using like the workflow dispatch and also like um, run it from CLI or UI to make it make the developer experience more seamless within our team. And some of the CNCF projects that were really, really helpful for us uh, were open telemetry for our observability, Grafana for visualization, Prometheus for metric scraping, uh, and Helm charts for package management, <coughs> and the recently sandbox project Kraken uh, for our chaos testing. So chaos testing is um, now incubated into our Keycloak benchmark, uh, our benchmark um, framework. And there are like patterns on how you can run those benchmarks and chaos tests on your own deployments. And we would like to encourage everyone to try those out and um, highlight any regressions or give us feedback on how we can improve on that. And obviously, this would not have been possible without Kubernetes, right? Like everything coexists because of that. And for what's in stake for the future, I would like to call back uh, Ryan to talk about it. Yeah, thank you. So um, these are a few things that we've got in mind for the near future of Keycloak. Um, I can't give specific releases because things have been actively worked upon, but they should be appearing very soon. Very soon being the, the next year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the big thing um, we're going for is zero downtime upgrades. We hear that upgrades is a pain point, like we're listening to the community on this one. For patch uh, releases. Yeah, sorry, yeah, for patch releases to begin with. Um, we're going to start small and then go big, um, maybe minor, major, who knows. But, you know, we'll start with patch releases and take it from there. Um, the next thing as well is, you know, we're aware this talk is very AWS specific, uh, what we've talked about at the moment. So we're looking into different ways uh, where we can adapt this architecture. So it's going to be either ideally cloud vendor agnostic or uh, provide blueprints that will also work on the different cloud providers. Um, there's been a lot of inspiration for that this week, so uh, we've got some ideas in mind for this. And Definitely. Yeah, watch this space on that one. Um, ARM support, um, I think most of the key cloak things kind of work already, but we need to full, ensure the full stack works as expected. And again, the various blueprints that we're promoting work as expected. So. Greener key cloak, cheaper key cloak, everyone wins. Um, we want to provide more security hardened blueprints. Um, you know, it's a security product at the end of the day. You can't get more, you know, you can't have enough security. And again, you know, it's been a great week, a um, lot of inspiration. Um, the more we can integrate with the CNCF ecosystem, you know, the better. And, there's been a lot of topics of discussion at the Project Pavilion this week that aren't on these slides, but you know we're going to come up with a, uh, we're going to take on board all the feedback we've heard, and that will definitely influence the, the roadmap in the near future. And For we definitely see like a lot of familiar faces who have visited our booth, and thank you for taking the time and coming and giving us the feedback. It, it's very, very crucial. We also encourage you to uh, take part in different initiatives that Keycloak community does different uh, special interest groups, uh, different events that happen like Keycloak Hour of Code, etc. Yeah, there's, for those not familiar, there's two special interest groups. There's the OAuth one, and then there is the new SRE one. Um, there's dedicated Slack channels for this. Anybody who's interested in contributing or just yeah, just attending to see what it's like, we highly encourage you to do that. For those of you who are not familiar with Keycloak, um, there's a QR code here for the Keycloak website. Um, please drop by, have a look. And we also have a QR code for feedback. But I think now if, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask on a microphone or me and Kamesh will be around for a few minutes after the talk as well, feel free to approach us. Happy to discuss anything you want to talk about. Keycloak related. Thanks. <laughs> So I, I have a question. If you have your um, Keycloak server deployed on a multi-AZ or yeah, multi-AZ Kubernetes cluster where your workers are spread across multiple AZs, do you need an external InfiniSpan server to make that work correctly? So we're actively kind of working on that at the moment. You can use a multi-AZ Kubernetes cluster and just you know, 
can make use of affinity settings and things like that. However, the problem is in the resiliency of the cache. So if you want to use persistent user sessions and num, of a, num owners one in the cache, you're probably going to be okay um, with what we provide at the moment. However, if you want the cache uh, to be replicated in a fault tolerant way, there's a bit of things yeah. missing there and we're actively working on that. It's a thing called InfiniSpan server hinting and mm -hmm. we need to improve the key cloak integration there. But multi-AZ Kubernetes is something we're working on and that might be our solution to the provide supporting uh, multiple cloud vendors, for example. If we can have a full stack, including the database that works well in a multi-AZ Kubernetes cluster, then maybe that's the work done. Depends what the community thinks. Okay, sounds good, thank and, you. And there are also like blueprints that are available in the guides section of Keycloak documentation oh. in the high availability. And there you will can get like more details about like how the blueprint was implemented and the architecture that Ryan <coughs> just talked about uh, is uh, laid out in much more detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so can you couple uh, the high availability inside an availability zone with high availability across availability zones. Your architecture showed, you know, two availability zones, but if I wanted to put in a second instance of Keycloak inside of the same availability zone just and, and across availability zones, would you support that? I mean, is that functional? Yeah, it is possible uh, to support within the same availability zone. We did similar tests for that. Um, but at least for the blueprints and the tests and the numbers that we captured, we did, the multi-site was done between two sites for now, but in theory, it should be able to expand it for more clusters. Thank you. So uh, the very nature of authentication services is that the load is gonna be varying a lot during the yeah. time of day. Also, sometimes the applications can implement something like incorrectly, yep. and then it's gonna create like bad traffic. Uh, how do you guys, uh, what, what, what are you guys, did you guys come across these kind of situations? How do you guys suggest we should handle that? Yeah, that is a very important consideration. We brainstorm when we come up with our synthetic workloads. I would like to call that like a camel curve. When organizations open up their office, like you see a big spike, and then like slowly it goes down, and then after the time to live, expires for a certain period, then again, you see some uh, influx in more requests. So we do account for that in our synthetic workloads when we do our tests. And that's where like uh, the feature like load shedding and other safeguards will help uh, the admins control the so traffic. Do you guys uh, have any um, suggestions on warming the cache or anything of that sort so that you can have like minimal amount of load sharing? Um, warming the cache, yes. It's generally a good practice to do that, uh, to warm up the cache, but we don't have like specific operational procedures to do that. I don't think so, no, no. Yeah, no, no. but it would warm up okay. by oh, the nature obviously. of adding more sessions to it. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. But in our test, like we don't, re we don't really see issues because of like a cold cache or something. And as well, you can size your caches accordingly. So, yeah. you know, if your Keycloak instance is going to be quite long lived. And so if you have quite a lot, if you can accommodate quite a large cache size, maybe you're going to get some load shedding on the first day or the first two days. But as time progresses, you would expect the load shedding not to happen every day because you're going to have a fair bit of the contents already in the right. caches. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. When you were describing InfiniSpan, you were talking about it having a Redis compatible API. Sure. Um, I'm assuming that Keycloak is not using that API and is only using the InfiniSpan one. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, so I, the, the reason for that though is um, because the InfiniSpan native um, client, uh, Hot Rod, it's called as the protocol, um, it is topology aware. So by Keycloak utilizing that, then we get some efficiency gains. Yeah. Okay. Right. We have time for, for some more questions if somebody's up for it. Uh, 
my, my question is, has Keycloak's mostly, our organization, and I believe most other organizations mostly use Keycloak for authentication. Mm -hmm. um, has there been, ever, you know, I'm sure you guys get requests, can Keycloak do authorization as well? And it's, it's kind of the sort of the, the other, sort of the missing half, if you will. So, so. Keycloak does authorization today. Um, yeah, so authorization, the authorization workflows that Keycloak supports, that's fully supported in this HA architecture. The, right. the HA architecture we've talked about today doesn't change that. Keycloak is fully featured. Um, anything it can do with a single instance, it can do in this. Okay. Thanks. Maybe I need to talk to you afterwards about Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everyone for the questions and attending today. Really appreciate it. Um, I think we're pretty much at the end of the conference, but yeah, safe trip home. <laughs>